Tales from my D&D campaign. Previously. We're looking for orcs carrying three humans. Have you seen them? They were attacked and slain near here by a group of foreign orcs from the desert. I didn't see that coming. These outsiders killed the boys, killed the prisoners too. Then the foreigners took something from the orc leader and headed back northeast towards Uruk. By the time Angel spots the orcs well concealed in the sand, they're only 80 feet away. I am Little One, Slayer of Marp. The orcs rise, five of them, no longer trying to hide. Why did you come out of the desert and attack those other orcs? Were you sent by visions from Grumsh or whoever? If you can beat us, I'll tell you who sent us. I assume you're stripping all her weapons and stuff. Of course. The other thing she has is the archaeological find that started all this. Draven, you're pretty sure that A, it's Itaran in origin, ooh, and B, it's just a part which has been disconnected from the controls of a larger device. After looting Hag's boys and interrogating their leader, the heroes have learned that an orc named Del, more or less Kajor's second in command, was behind these orcs' hunt for the ancient relic. Not only that, but while the name had meant nothing to them at the time, Berg's gang had also gotten the idea from Dell to go after the Frost Giant Sword in Baron Silverload's dining room. That's Draven's father-in-law. The connection was probably just a coincidence. Certainly there's no way some orc in the mid-desert would have known that this group of PCs from 300 miles away would intercept the warriors hunting this artifact. But regardless of whether he knew about Draven and his family, this Dell was clearly manipulating other orcs for some mysterious purpose. So we got the thingy. Do we take it back to the Basilica? The archaeologists are dead. And we took out the orcs, so we don't have to keep going. But Dell's still out there. Along with whatever equipment this was attached to. But the Hand would want to find out what happened, and figure out what this thing is. I'll definitely send them a message. I'll cast sending to tell Jonason. Actually, Jonason's assistant. Much more diplomatic. But if we want to learn about this thing, the answers are more likely out there than in the lab. We also haven't done anything about Zaheer. He's been gone a long time. We don't really have any leads on him, do we? Don't think so. I feel bad about what happened to Zaheer, but we're out here now. So, do we know where this thing came from? Not exactly. Based on what Angel saw of the witnesses' memories, you could easily find the ruins of Kuraj, the village whose people once searched the desert for relics of the Shatter War and the Ancients. You know the archaeologists used that as a starting point when they headed into the desert, using some kind of search pattern, and probably a lot of luck, to find the site of the strange metal room the witness described. That is where they found this ancient Ataran machine part, which the orcs had been after. And it only took them a couple days? Well, it was more like a couple weeks, but since they were trying to search, the actual distance covered was probably smaller than it sounds. Still, replicating their path would be really hard. Except that Mora can cast Lay of the Land once a day. Lay of the Land is a powerful navigation spell which gives the caster a bird's eye view of the terrain in a 50 mile radius as though looking at a detailed map. She should be able to spot any unusual terrain feature with that, even a small cave mouth. So long as the entrance hasn't been well and deliberately hidden, there's a very good chance she will spot it. So we just have to get within 50 miles. That's huge. That's like a whole day's travel, considerably more than a day's travel in the desert. Still, that spell makes this sound really viable, and I am very interested in the ruins where they found this. Interested on multiple levels. It's ancient, it seems to be a Taran, it may contain equipment or information I could use to help solve this astral plague thing. And the orcs seem to be looking for it. And the Kuatoa. What Kuatoa? At the other place, Ginneron. GE7 seemed to think Kua Commander knew about the portal. It may just have been that specific place, though. You really don't know. And you're pretty sure he died when he went down the drain, and astral plague and stuff. I think what we do is, we go looking for the Atar and stuff. If we find Del along the way, we'll mop him up. But he's not the priority. Priority is the Atar and stuff. Draven casts the spell Sending to update the Hand of Sirius, explaining that they killed the orcs, Recovered the item, but no survivors, and they were investigating further. 
Then they start moving further east through the arid plains of Angor, hugging the edge of the northern mountain range while they assess their desert survival preparations. I did get Rainbow Dash one of our traveler's cloaks in her size. That provides water. I should point out that your cloaks protect against cold, but not heat. You may need other measures to help you deal with the temperatures. Huh? Those cloaks have endure elements. I remember you got them for some winter travel, and I'm pretty sure they only have the cold half of endure elements. Well, damn. Also, if you end up going further in, it can get very hot in a deep desert. Like, really hot. Like, sandstorm setting heat protection bands. It doesn't sound like you need to stray too far from the edges, but if you did, you can get to places so hot that the spell Endure Elements and similar effects only help a bit, rather than fully protecting you. But Endure Elements says... Endure Elements has a temperature range. I'm saying I borrowed some rules from a desert setting book called Sandstorm, where heat in certain places can be so extreme that even fire-immune creatures might have to limit their exposure. Though again, I don't expect you have to worry about that anytime soon. But if you go deeper into Uruk, you may need Endure Elements just to improve conditions up to regular heat exhaustion. Man, there must be good shit to fight in the deep desert. Otherwise, why would orcs hang out there all the time? The cloaks don't make unlimited water, but they make enough for one person each day under normal weather. Even normal desert takes double water rations, maybe more depending on exertion, but because Black has the cantrip Create Water, and I made cantrips at will, they're pretty set in that department. I should also note that in the desert, any kind of armor could start to cause you problems. Even a chain shirt? Chain shirt's pretty light, but it's still worse than no armor. Does that mean I should ditch my awesome armor and go with this desert armor? Doesn't your armor have heat protection? It has energy protection. It protects against electrical and negative energy. It doesn't do heat and cold. Well, that sucks. It does so many things you just assumed. You know, I don't technically have to wear my armor. It takes a couple seconds to put on. That's right. Your mechanized plate only takes one round to don. That's some Iron Man shit. Mine's a standard action. My armor and my weapon are stored in the Ring of Arming. What's awesome is I can wear a chain shirt while walking around, then switch that quickly to my dragon scale plate. Is there any way I can mess with you? Like, store something else in there? When I use it, it puts on whatever's in the ring. Like a thong? <laughs> That'd be awesome. But then I'd have to kill you. They help Black put some straps on his folded up armor so he can carry it like a backpack. I'm so white under here. Everyone's like, oh my god, there's a guy under there. We were starting to think you were warforged. I'll take off my chain shirt and cast mage armor. It's one hour per caster level, long enough for daytime stuff. That'll make it a lot easier, for sure. And Mora's going to switch her armor for one of those orcish breastplates. She's an Aventi, an aquatic race. She could use the extra protection against heat and dryness. Yeah, it's a good thing you guys have infinite water, because she's using even more than the rest of you. What about our horse? Can she move okay in the sand? Rainbow Dash is actually not that badly adapted, even though she's not from a desert environment. Her feet are so big that the extra surface area helps her to sink in less than her weight would imply. Draven, can you give her flying? Yes, for specific problems, but not long enough for general travel. What you really need is some item to give her overland flight, which lasts in hours. When they reach the wind-carved formation known as the Dragon Rocks, the land is transitioning into endless waves of sand. From here, they pivot northward, continuing to follow the mountains along the edge of the desert. They spot some camels moving across the blasted landscape, and they are attacked once by big lizards, about Komodo dragon size. The lizards are literally no threat to such powerful adventurers, and after butchering one batch, future lizards seem to keep their distance. Mostly. About the third day after turning left, you spot some griffins flying over the mountains. They're so far off you can see them just enough to tell they aren't birds. Ah, if I didn't have Rainbow Dash, we could get us some griffins. I like griffins. Your problem is you like everything. You just want to recruit everything. Damn right. You actually shouldn't be playing D&D, you should be playing Pokemon. Gotta catch them all. Rainbow Dash, I choose you! Soon. About a week after the fight with Hag's orc band, they discover the ruined, once-hidden village of Kuraj, Zaheer's childhood home. It was destroyed over a decade ago when the orcs finally found it, but it's the key starting point for retracing the steps of the archaeologists. From there, they head into the desert proper, 
with Mora using Lay of the Land daily to look for anything that might be a dig site or a cave entrance. It takes days and days of traveling, but it's not that bad. There's actually more wildlife than you normally think of in a desert. Snakes and beetles. It's when you look every direction and see nothing. That's what I don't like. As long as we're near mountains, it's fine. Oh, and giant scorpions. Well, you don't see any scorpions that you have to worry about. The biggest you see is about hand size. It's the little ones you have to worry about. Yeah, the little ones will kill you. The smaller the claws, the deadlier the poison. <laughs> As the mountains behind them grow smaller, the temperatures climb to the point that the noon peak threatened to exceed the 140 Fahrenheit, 60 degrees Celsius maximum of the Endure Element spell, which only Draven had actually cast. They decide it's time to switch to traveling at night. Draven's goggles now grant dark vision. But Black, with his unaided human eyes, still needs light to see, so he activates the gleaming beacon of his mace. No, put that out! That's going to be visible for miles around. If you want that thing on, the rest of us should all move a hundred feet to the right. Adopt plan? Anglerfish. For moving in the dark, we could tie a leash around you. There aren't any roots or anything to stumble over. I've got news for you. Mora's in the same boat. Aw, oh, man... Mora also has a whole bunch of penalties from the breastplate of the desert, since she isn't actually proficient with medium armor. But that probably only matters if they're in combat. The new moon provides little light, but since they're riding a platform on a huge animal, Mora and Black can actually get by pretty well without seeing. Until they encounter anything. Then they encounter anything. Draven, what you see is basically... Worm sign. What? There's a large mound of sand moving towards you. Something big is below the surface. Shai Halud? I sure hope not. Well, it's plowing through the sand, heading for you. Presumably the sand is also offering some kind of protection. I jump down, extend my spear, and ready for a charge. Mirror image. Haste. I give us all my deflection bonus to AC. Whatever it is, it actually slows down and doesn't charge. Instead... A very large thing shoots up out of the ground, much larger than you expected. It rears back and strikes down at little one. Hits AC 25. AC 30. Isn't it higher than that, with Draven giving you plus 4? I don't have my shield. Black jumps off the horse and uses Knight's move to teleport into position behind the monster, while Angel runs over but misses her attack. I activate my burning blade maneuver, hit three times, take 89 damage total. It resists a chunk of each hit, but takes most of the damage. Notably, it doesn't specifically resist the fire. Mora misses, and Draven deals 25 fire damage from one of his wands, but even that damage is reduced a little. Huh? It has gargantuan creature damage reduction. By the way, for those of you standing on the ground, it's coming up. This was just a fail. Oh, that makes a lot more sense. That's awesome. And bad. Angel and Black are knocked off its back with a reflex save to regain their footing. I'm prone. It's a reflex save. Everyone on the ground somehow passes the save, so only Black actually fell as the massive scorpion surfaces, with sand pouring down between its huge armor plates. And yes, it does have tremor sense, which is why it was able to attack with its head buried. The gargantuan DR rule I instituted represents the fact that some monsters are so large that even a magic sword is barely a pinprick unless wielded in a truly heroic fashion. And while an army of a hundred archers might take down most huge, like elephant-sized monsters, at a certain point, even without unholy power or skin made of rock, a creature is simply so large that their arrows or bolts or even spears would never defeat it. So after any other resistances or damage reduction, I give a gargantuan monster a threshold of 16 and reduction 8. This means you take whatever damage is left from each attack, adding all the damage types together. If the total is less than the 16 damage threshold, the attack does nothing. If the total is 16 damage or more, the attack is big enough to get through, but its damage is still reduced by 8, and this DR cannot be bypassed by any of the usual things which get around damage reduction, like Little One's Mountain Hammer Maneuver. There are also some creatures which are colossal. If gargantuan creatures, such as large sauropod dinosaurs, are the heavyweights of D&D, colossal monsters are the super heavyweights. If you fought Godzilla, Gojira, he would count as colossal. 
and under this rule he'd have a threshold of 24 and colossal DR of 12. What's the armor class of your images, Angel? 10 plus size bonus plus dex. I could have told you that. I mean, what is it? Mr. Scorpion turns sideways, tries to grab Little One and Angel, and to impale Black with its tail. It swats one of Angel's images, and an immense claw is barely stopped by Little One's deflection bonus. Thank you, Draven. And it rolls horribly and misses Black, despite him being prone. If it missed me, I get an attack. Black activates his Counter-Strike Bracers, giving him an immediate attack against an enemy who just missed him. He hits the Scorpion for 12, but that's less than the Gargantuan threshold of 16, so it just bounces off. Ah, can I throw this thing? How many size categories bigger is it? Let's see, it goes medium, large, huge, Gargantuan. Oh man, you have to fell the greatest foe me. So much damage. Hmm, so it has plus 12 on the opposed check if I try to throw it. Black has to stand up, so he only gets one attack, but he scores a critical hit. I'd better make it count. Take 32. It resists some, obviously, but minus 8, that's still 24 damage to the Gargantuan Scorpion. Flanking the Arachnid, Angel sneak attacks for 24, enough that most of her damage gets through. Then Little One takes a spear in both hands and hits it with Elder Mountain Hammer. Normally, all the Mountain Hammer maneuvers ignore damage reduction, but this doesn't get around my special Giant Monster DR. Despite that, it was still a 45 damage hit, and Mr. Scorpion is finally bloodied. The massive arachnid lets out a high-pitched shriek, followed by a wave of subsonic vibrations which liquefy the sand for a second. It's basically diving under, but everyone needs to make a reflex save to avoid being dragged down by the temporary quicksand-like effect, and have to spend an action to dig yourself out. Really? Reflex? Do I get an attack of opportunity? I will say yes, only because with your stance you are basically ignoring the effects of the sandquake. Then I hit for 20. Is my head at least above the surface? Yeah, you're only pulled down a couple feet. Black gets sucked down and spends the next round digging himself out, but otherwise they have no target to attack, so they spend a round buffing and healing, and it still hasn't shown up. I want it to come back. I'd be happy to never see it again. It's gonna come back eventually. Maybe not. It's like an animal, right? It's injured. It's gonna come back. I want it to. One, I'd like to finish it off because... Well, we started fighting it. Two, it's huge, it's under our feet, it has a poisonous spine, I'd like it dead. And three, it scares the shit out of me. I'd like it dead. I changed stance, can I smell it out? Well, it definitely smells like a giant scorpion. It's down there, but you aren't yet able to pinpoint it underground. Or is it so big that it's all around you? Can I stab it through the ground? You can try. It must be pretty deep, though, since you can't see a bulge in the sand. Is there any rock we can get up on? There's one of those tall, bumper-like rocks just off the battle map, but it would be a pain in the ass to climb. It's concave underneath, and the top is 20 feet up. I cast Fell the Greatest Foe on Angel. I'll stab into the ground, looking for it again. Wait. First, its turn comes up again, and so does it. Now, what to do? Is it going to go for the horse? Not the horse! If it eats the horse, I'm killing it with my bare hands. It's surfacing like a whale, trying to land on top of you guys. What? Come on! The pincers rise out of the ground, spraying sand all over, massive plates and tons of muscle launching upward. Shouldn't Rainbow Dash get an attack of opportunity as it's coming up? Mm. Rainbow Dash is running away. She could kick and run. Is it coming down on me? Sadly, no. Aww. As big as it is, it's not quite big enough to hit everyone it wants to. You still need to make a reflex save to not get knocked down by the sand wave. I get... uh... 21. Well, okay then, it looks like you... Uh... No, wait. It's plus... No, I get... 19. Then... you get knocked down. Sorry. 20 was the number. You need a flipper on your back, like a battle bot, so you can right yourself. You get right on that. Everyone in the landing zone manages to save, avoiding severe damage. 
but anyone else on the ground failed to save, being knocked prone. Mr. Scorpion claws Rainbow Dash. Well, of us all, Rainbow Dash has the most hit points. She can take a few hits. And I'm gonna say she's too big for improved grab, though it probably could. Then, possible crit on Black. 32 to confirm? Nope. AC 33. Okay, no crit, but now make an opposed grapple check. You need to roll a 20. Unless it rolls a 1. Okay... Black has a grapple bonus too. He probably has a pretty big grapple check. But it has plus 37. Black does not roll the 18 or whatever he needs to have a chance, and is caught in the massive claw, unable to move, and taking an extra 14 damage from being crushed. That all count as one attack? Um, yeah, it's really all one attack. Might as well, because I'm stuck in his claw. Black triggers his retributive amulet and deals half the damage back to the scorpion. And the damage is really starting to add up, even against this mountain of hit points. Could be worse. Good thing it didn't grab you before diving. Oh man, water breathing wouldn't help against that. And it hits Angel with its massive poisonous tail. Roll for mirror image. And it hits a fake angel with its massive poisonous tail. Good thing I cast that. Ah, uh, screw it. I'll call out for Rainbow Dash to just full attack it. She should turn sideways, give it like a broadside kick. Could she trample it? No, you can only trample things that are smaller. You have to be big enough to completely cover whatever it is. Rainbow Dash hits all three times, and each hit does at least a little damage through the supersized DR. Then it's Black's turn again. So, I need to get out. The way I'm running Grapple, you aren't pinned and doomed forever. You'll automatically be released on its turn. That's why I apply the Constrict damage right away. Ah. So you're immobilized through your turn, but unless it hits you again, you'll be free the following turn. So Black attacks the best he can, then Angel, switching her stance back to Step of the Wind, gets up on the beast and shreds it for 26, 22, and 21 damage. The buff Black cast on her earlier, Fell the Greatest Foe, adds plus 1d6 damage to her attacks per size category that her target is larger than she is, which, against the Gargantuan Scorpion, was a massive plus 4d6 per attack. I'll Searing Charge it. Can I land on its back? I mean, it's technically not the closest square. Um, sure. Makes it harder for it to hit me with its tail. Actually, it's a scorpion. The tail is designed for attacking forward, not back. Huh. Oh well. Actually, it hasn't used its attack for opportunity this round. And you're charging through its reach... And it misses. Close. And... I hit it for 37! Eh, feel that, bitch. More of full attacks from the back of Rainbow Dash, but every shot from her repeating crossbow bounces off the scorpion's armor. I haven't gone in a while. You're up next, right after Mora. Oh man, he's all set up for the kill steal. Three hits, one of which crit. The immense beast reels, throwing little one off one side, throwing angel off the other, though she swings around the tail and lands on her feet. The horrific death wail reverberates across the blasted waste, its rumble vibrating the sand enough that the body sinks a couple feet. I assume I'm performing surgery for the poison gland? Let the professionals handle this. It's so big, it's almost more like mining. Like you ought to get some dwarves in there to help. What are we rolling for? They're trying to get the poison. It's tricky to get in there without exposing yourself to it, plus it denatures quickly if exposed to air. Under Angel's surprisingly knowledgeable supervision, they manage to harvest two doses of pretty hardcore poison. Fort save difficulty 25, and it deals 1d8 constitution damage. D8 damage to a character attribute is huge, and because it's con, it can result in a loss of as much as four hit points per level of the victim. Apart from the poison, it looked like some of the scorpion's chitinous plates could be used to make non-metal full plate, but nobody needs it. A scorpion plate shield would be lighter than a metal one, but provides no actual bonuses. Nevertheless, it seems like something cool. It, it feels a little bit like taking down a dragon, if a relatively easy one. So they set about harvesting what they can. Little One in particular, who was using his blacksmithing skills to help eye out the best sections for use in armor, rolls super high, helping them get some nice intact plates from places they didn't hit. Almost too nice. It was hard to imagine what they would use the huge plates for without cutting them. Barding! I was thinking, 
Oh, the horse can carry... Wait, the horse! So with the idea of making some super awesome scorpion plate horse barding in the future, they mount some pairs of chitinous plates, balancing them as well as they can on opposite sides of Rainbow Dash. That looks pretty heavy. We might not be able to ride the horse for a while. I'm pretty sure she can handle my weight. Angel weighs like 40 pounds with gear. A gnome's a third of a person, right? By weight, yeah. Actually, Rainbow Dash could pull more than she can carry. Normally, perhaps, but dragging it through the sand is probably rough. They travel through the night, and the next day, as they camp out through most of the daylight hours, they eat the meat off the back of the scorpion plates. Left in the sun, it pretty much cooks itself. Can we use the stinger as a weapon? Like, mount it as a big club or something? Uh, the stinger is huge. It's like a couple feet around and six feet long. Wait, the stinger is? Yeah. What did that thing need to defend itself against? Adventurers. Orcs? They are fighting something out there in the deep desert. After a number of false positives, they're checking out yet another boring rock, having Rainbow Dash dig around it. But as she pulls away, they spot a little crevice about five feet down, where sand appears to be falling away into the darkness beyond. They get the big clumsy hooves out of the way, and the stronger PCs get down there with shovels, revealing an entrance the size of a regular double door, with a dark tunnel beyond. They don't need to clear the whole door, though. They just shove enough sand out of the way to push their way into the blue metal-lined passage. Does my armor power up? You can feel something, like it's definitely trying to react somehow, but there's no actual effect that you can tell. Like, it's unable to connect or something. Crappy Wi-Fi. The passage slopes down, making several right-angle turns. As they get farther in, they find a yellow line around the outer wall, which must have been worn away by the sand in the upper parts. Does it have those light bars like a Ginneron? There are ridges in the corners which may have been like those, but if so, they are powered down or burnt out. The ramp loops all the way around a couple times, descending until 60 feet down, there's another doorway. What lies beyond the door does resemble the small metal room the archaeologists had supposedly found, but the door to the room is out of position, with the floor up at an angle, leaving a sizable gap between the end of the hallway and the small metal chamber, a gap which opens into a wider dark space below. What the heck? What the heck is this place? Find out next time on Tales from My D&D Campaign. So the plan is to finish the magic item quest. If we run into Dell on the way, great, but otherwise, he's not our number one priority. Hi, but not number one. We still need to cure this astral plague. Well, now that you suspect the source of the item is probably a Taran, there's a chance this place might have the kind of equipment you're looking for. Have we figured out if there's any potential for us to be able to use the curse? Like, the actual power? Like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I would go more Tony Stark. You're not that far into the research yet. We don't necessarily have to cure it if we can find a way to use it. We could all just turn ourselves into Warforged. I'm not entirely opposed to that. We could live forever. You want to live forever? Of course. What kind of question is that? Duh. <laughs>